Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. with the idea of the genetic mystique. In 1995, Dorothy Nelkin and Susan Lindy published a book called The DNA Mystique, which many of you may know. And the subtitle was The Gene as Cultural Icon. And in it they wrote, just as the Christian soul has provided an archetypal concept through which to understand the person and the continuity of the self, so DNA appears in popular culture as a soul-like entity, a wholly and immortal relic. It is the essential entity, the location of the true self in the narratives of biological determinism. Now, genetic determinism is just one of many variants of biological determinism of the sort that Nelkin and Lindy identify. And other variants include the belief that race or sex determines destiny, that people of color are only suited to manual work, or that women should confine their career ambitions to motherhood or the nurturing professions. Now, those views still persist, but luckily, I think, they aren't as respectable as they used to be. There is certainly a persistent popular and media tendency to define personal identity as genetically determined, and there have been media stories which have focused on all of these, but the, the front runner at the moment for the least scientifically plausible gene award is the American exceptionalism gene, which is posited by the US conservative columnist, Michael Medved. Medved has written, in today's ruthlessly competitive international economy, the United States may benefit from a potent but unheralded advantage, the aggressive edge sustained by the inherited power of American DNA. And Medved goes on to argue that there was probably a genetic component to American immigrants' deliberate choice to shoulder the risks of the Atlantic voyage, which still stands their descendants in good stead. That's his argument. Now, he doesn't wince at the contrast with those subjected against their will to the evils of the Middle Passage across the Atlantic from Africa, that is, the enslaved ancestors of today's African Americans. And Medved writes, quote, the idea of a distinctive, unifying, risk-taking American DNA might also help to explain our most persistent and painful racial divide between the progeny of every immigrant nationality that chose to come here and the one significant group that exercised no choice in making their journey to the US. Nothing in the horrific ordeal of African slaves, seized from their homes against their will, reflected a genetic predisposition to risk-taking or any sort of self-selection based on personality traits. Now, in that last sentence, Medved does concede that modern African Americans might now have a somewhat better genetic propensity, in his terms, for risk-taking because their original African blood has been diluted. But it's still a genes are us style of argument. That is, it's just that the genes have changed, not that he's had second thoughts about whether genetics is the basis of identity and behavior. And he claims that President Barack Obama's, quote, desire to impose a European-style welfare state and a command and control economy not only contradicts our proudest political and economic traditions, but the new revelations about American DNA, I'm not quite sure where these revelations came from. <laughs> the new revelations about American DNA suggest that such ill-starred schemes may go against our very nature. Now, critics have called Medved's stance just another example of American exceptionalism. That is the founding myth that regards America as different from all other countries and as implicitly superior. So, in any case, Medved's claim goes beyond the already ambitious idea that our deepest individual identities are determined by our genes, that genes are us, in the useful phrase developed by the British bioethicist Ruth Chadwick. Instead, Medved stretches that problematic claim well beyond its snapping point by arguing that the entire United States as a nation is defined by its DNA, and that one of the most disadvantaged ethnic subgroups, African Americans, 
that it's more or less inevitable that they will remain disadvantaged. He doesn't mention First Nation peoples. I think that's rather interesting. He could, of course, <coughs> mention indigenous peoples. Um, presumably, he might also think that they lack initiative genes. But I want to make the point that leaving the political questions out for the time being, genetic determinism is also philosophically incoherent because it contradicts itself quite seriously about initiative and free will. This is a very familiar and common flaw in the equally familiar assertion about how science, usually neuroscience, but sometimes also genetics, has conclusively demonstrated that free will is an illusion. For example, the US plant scientist, Anthony Cashmore, recently declared, quote, it is often suggested that, indiv that individuals are free to choose and modify their environment, and that, <coughs> that in this respect, they control their destiny. This argument misses the simple but crucial point that any action as, quote, free as it may appear, simply reflects the genetics of the organism and the environmental history. This leads us into what, philosophically speaking, would be a form of epistemological relativism, that is, how much we can know about what we can know. So even if it's not my motivation to convince you, even if I don't care about convincing you, I really have no reason to think that my beliefs about free will, if I share Cashmore's view that it's non-existent, that they have any independent universal validity, apart from what my genes tell me to say. So we have a risk of infinite regress. How do I know that this is true? Well, my genes tell me. What do my genes tell me? They tell me that my genes tell me. If you believe the opposite, let's say that you don't believe that genes are us, then there's no way of knowing which of us is right. And that, to me, is a very crucial problem. So to go back to Medved's argument, ironically, get up and go, American or otherwise, initiative, is the first casualty of genetic determinism. If you really believe that it's all down to the genes, there's no room at all for individual initiative or autonomy. Those two are merely the products of our genes, so we don't really deserve any credit for them. Genes command in this view, and we obey. At this point, I will inevitably be bringing up Richard Dawkins' selfish gene hypothesis. The version of it that I think is most widely accepted, that it, you encounter most widely, I'm not sure it's Dawkins' own version, but the popular version of it, is that not only do we obey our genes, our genes themselves are controlled by the demands of evolutionary success, by the need to pass themselves on. So really, not much is left of us at all in this account. There's very little agency. We are doubly controlled, first by our genes, and our genes in turn are controlled by the demands of evolutionary success. In fact, our personal identity has been obliterated. So why do so many people find this an attractive view? <laughs> I personally find it a very unattractive view. Well, I think there are several reasons, but I'm going to be looking at three in particular. One is that not all behavioral genetic correlations are as spurious as the one put forward by Medved. For example, in May 2011, the Journal of Human Genetics published a, st a study which links your satisfaction with life to the type of 5-HTT gene found in your genome. This gene encodes a transporter for the brain chemical serotonin, which has been shown to be involved in depression and mood. And of over 2,500 Americans who were surveyed for this study, 69% of those who had two copies of the long version of the gene were satisfied or very satisfied with life, compared to only 38% of those with two copies of the short version of the gene. The second reason I think why genetic determinism is popular is the manner in which genetic research has been systematically sold over the past 40 years since Time magazine published an issue on the new genetics as far back as 1971. Genes have been hailed as the building blocks of biology, the blueprint for how to build a human, and the so-called language of life, in Francis Collins' phrase. And it seems clear from their own accounts that many of the Human Genome Project researchers, that is, the project to sequence the entire human genome, such as Francis Collins and the British scientist John Sulston, genuinely believed that sequencing the entire human genome would bring tremendous benefits to medical research in a comparatively short time. 
when the first draft of the human genome was sequenced in 2000, an editor at the respected science journal Nature even predicted that by the end of the 21st century, quote, genomics will allow us to alter entire organisms out of all recognition to suit our needs and tastes and will allow us to fashion the human form into any conceivable shape. We will have extra limbs if we want them, maybe even wings to fly. Now, whether such rather overheated claims were encouraged by commercial interests is an interesting speculation. And it's actually more than a speculation because it has been researched quite extensively by a number of researchers, but in particular the British geneticist Helen Wallace, who has a PhD in genetics, runs an organization called Gene Watch UK. And Wallace has done a, a painstaking and superbly documented report in which she has uncovered new evidence of tobacco and food industry involvement in what she views as the murky origins of the Human Genome Project. And she has uncovered memos circulated in the tobacco industry, which indicated that they viewed it as being in their interest to isolate some individuals as genetically prone to lung cancer so that anyone with a genetic all clear could continue to puff cheerfully on. And that is actually the phrase that was used in one of the memos that, that she uncovered. A third reason why the genes are us view continues to be popular, I think, is that people perhaps don't realize the comparative lack of impact on medical treatment that genetics has so far actually had. Indeed, it's been said, after 10 years of effort since the Human Genome Project, geneticists are almost back to square one in knowing where to look for the roots of common disease. For example, a recent study of 101 genetic variants showed no value at all in forecasting heart disease in a group of 22,000 white US women over a 10 year period. So this is actually a very large scale study and it's not that I'm happy about this result, I think this is too bad, but it just shows you that the predictive power is less than had been forecast. Again, another example might be cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is the most common recessive genetic condition in Caucasians and about one in every 25 individuals of European descent carries a mutated copy. While the mutation has been successfully identified, no one has so far developed any therapies targeted at the CFTR protein that it expresses. The so-called cystic fibrosis gene itself has become the basis of much further genomic research, some of it potentially productive. But as some commentators in the field themselves admit, sequencing the human genome has done a lot for science and not so much for medicine. And the researcher Jack Reardon, who collaborated in the original sequencing of the CF gene, puts it this way, quote, the disease has contributed much more to science than science has contributed to the disease. Developing a cure for cystic fibrosis is not like going to the moon, it's like going to Mars. Another reason I think why the reality is more complicated than many people think is epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Well, when you consider that all cells in the human body carry the same complement of about 25,000 genes, those genes come out very differently in, say, the heart and the retina, or teeth and eyeballs. So what determines how the genes are expressed is epigenetics. What factors activate or silence the way the genes are expressed? Are expressed. And this could be tremendously important in establishing what turns having a genetic propensity to cancer, say, into having the disease itself. So epigenetics has moved well beyond the straightforward association of one gene, one trait, or the notion that genotype, what you can't see, accounts for every aspect of phenotype, what you can see. As one leading scientist, Edith Heard, has written in a 10 years on review of what's been achieved since the sequencing of the human genome, quote, epigenetics may provide hope that we are more than just a sequence of our genes and that our destiny and that of our children can be shaped to some extent by our lifestyle and environment. Well, so far I've really been very skeptical about some of the founding myths of popular genetics, the genetic mystique, genetic exceptionalism, and the idea that one gene determines one trait. But I do want to qualify this to a certain extent. When genetic determinism is used to justify and reinforce the underprivileged status of a particular ethnic group, like African Americans, then I think it's quite suspect. But what if such a group can actually use genetic determinism 
to their advantage? Does that then change the political equation? Not the scientific equation, but does it change the political arguments about the status quo that I also found objectionable in Medved's view? The novelist, the Ojibwe novelist, Louise Adrick, who wrote The Beat Queen, tells a story of how she was contemplating taking a personal genetic test of the sort you can now purchase over the internet by providing a, a spit sample and a certain amount of cash. And she says, when I asked my extended family about this, and I did go to everyone, I was told, it's not yours to give, Louise. Now, I think this is interesting. It's not just a rarefied view, I think, that pertains only to indigenous populations. It raises some of the most profound problems about genetic testing, such as whether a diagnosis with implications for other family members should be revealed. So these peoples actually view genetic information as a core part of their identity, but they lack that individualistic interpretation of it as being owned by one person that Medved has. So does that mean that genes are us after all? Is there a sort of let out clause for communitarian views of, of the genome? Well, the one sense in which I think this view that genes are us is, is valid, is important, is in the sense that the genome should be seen, as the UNESCO Convention says, as the common heritage of humanity, rather than as the private property of, for example, biotechnology firms. And many people don't know <laughs> that one in five human genes is now actually the subject of a patent, sometimes meaning that cheaper drugs can't be developed, for example, if other companies want to do research on that particular gene, so that it can be argued that this is actually a barrier to scientific progress whereas the ostensible rationale for patenting is that it helps scientific progress. 